various models about the environment and how we can make them <coughs> more conducive to physical activity. Well, as many of the presentations have alluded to, we also need to inject a sense of political uh, rhetoric and political action when we're talking about physical activity promotion with disabled people. Now, if we're talking about the UK, it's very sad for me to say that we do terribly when it comes to disabled adults. So, for example, just last week, uh, the United Nations, as we've heard about this today, uh, criticised the UK for failure failure to uphold uh, disabled people's human rights. So, for example, uh, in a, uh, a lack of physical activity is not simply about inaccessible environments. It's not simply about, as an example, motivation. It's a highly politicised issue. It's often as well linked to disabilism, which is about the oppression of disabled people. We need to inject more of that in our research. We need to inject more of that in our policy, saying it, this is wrong. This is wrong. Some work that we did, Activity Alliance have supported this, has just highlighted a, a key barrier to physical activity. It's not simply in accessible environments, as an example, but the fear, the fear of being active. Why? Because many people, uh, disabled people, are on personal budgets. They are scared of using personal budgets, which is legal. They are scared of using personal budgets to be physically active because they're, they are seen to be physically active. They are under the strong impression led by Daily Mail, etc., etc., that they will have their disability uh, personal budget withdrawn so they are not physically active. Okay? So we can see how this becomes personal in, um, politicized. And secondly, if we look at it on the other side of disabledism, the other side of the coin, ableism, when we're talking about sedentary behavior messages, for example, we often hear stand up uh, or move more and so on. Those are often unintentionally stressed, unintentionally ableist. The assumption, the assumption that uh, we can all operate with a certain type of body on this norm. Well, disabled adults, disabled children do not operate like that. So we need to be very cognizant of the ableist attitudes that we're embedding within many of our health promotion, physical activity, activity promotion discourses, often unintentionally. And sedentary behaviour is perhaps the prime example on that. And if we progress on this as well, when we're looking about the importance of participatory work, co-production, uh, and all these other key issues that we talked about. Disabled people are at the forefront of this. We talk in the medical world about P uh, PPI, patient public involvement. We talk about citizen science. We talk about, uh, I read in the British Journal of Sports Medicine recently, uh, participatory medicine. We've been doing that since the 1960s, disabled people. <laughs> disabled people have been advocating that. That's not new. It's old hat. And I think we need to celebrate this more, but also take on board some of the valuable aspects that disabled can teach us about doing research as part of this co-production. And one thing that has been abundantly clear on this is we cannot simply transport some common or key ideas that we think work in the uh, non-disabled population into this context. If we take the examples given about web-based resources, many of my colleagues uh, talk about the importance of digital uh, work, e-health and so on. Really important, really important stuff. But again, there are ableist attitudes running through that. The assumption that, for example, that everybody could access X, Y and Z, when that's not the case. Because people are operating within a certain ableist lens, and we need to do that. And the, a very good example of this, and my apologies to the US colleagues in this room, the US guidelines is a perfect example of that. Uh, if we look at that, how disabled people are talked about in the US guidelines of having conditions, uh, not very good, not having anybody on the expert groups that are disabled, not having co produced. And I think lastly, what people have uh, highlighted in this, and th this is a tension, I appreciate this, I've done a review with Public Health England, uh, I appreciate this tension. It's about thinking differently about what evidence-based research is about. Because if we take the traditional hierarchy of methods and the gold standards where RCTs are, the t uh, are at the top, often RCTs are, are not appropriate for disabled people. And when asked what types of research methods they want, as has been highlighted here, they want different research methods to be able to illuminate different things. So by excluding this research, such as the US guidelines have done, they have excluded disabled people's voices in terms of what they want, which is atrocious. Atrocious on this thing. So, 
I, I think this has been a great call for action, and if we take the different organisations that has been alluded to as well, we have some great uh, organisations that I think we need to connect better. Within the UK, sadly too often we work in silos, so we have our various uh, organisations, researchers and so on, and when I keep going back to them, we're replicating research after research after research, wasting resources and not harnessing different expertise. And I think that would be one of the uh, lessons I've learned from, uh, from this, is that I'm not an expert, we have different experts, and we need to work much more closely together rather than being having this umbrella of competitive funding, competitive to be X, Y, and Z. It's about working together to do something really important, and that's working with disabled people to promote physical activity. So thanks for your attendance. This is a first for this conference. So thanks to the organisations organization for allowing us to be here and promoting it and let's let's spread the word. Thank you. <laughs>